you for hearing our praise. Thank you that we can clap our hands, Lord God. Thank you so much for giving us so many reasons to be grateful, Lord God. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. How are you all doing this morning? Blessed and highly favored. Praise the Lord. 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 Call and response. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I give an honor to God. I again um, thank Jesus for being my Lord and Savior and thank God for yet an opportunity, another opportunity to say yes. And I indeed say yes this morning. As imperfect as I am, as unworthy as I am, I'm grateful that he allows me to serve the food up at his table. Amen. Hallelujah. And give me the opportunity to pour into his people. And I thank God for those who are here. Amen. I thank God for those who have made the trek. You could have stayed in your bed. You could have done bedside baptism, as Pastor Trina calls it. And I'm grateful that I have some brethren and some sisters uh, to worship with this morning. And I um, also want to welcome everyone who is here online. Thank you for joining us. We praise the Lord for you and pray that uh, something is said this morning that will touch your heart, that will change your life. We're still praying for all of those who are on the prayer list. And Pastor Trina said we weren't adding anyone, but I'll add my little granddaughter, Noel. Uh, she got up with a, with a cough. She went off and went to a party yesterday. I don't know if that's where she got it or not, but uh, I pray that she gets better real soon. And as soon as, and, and as she gets better, then we'll get to see Brother Noah. Amen. <laughs> Today was supposed to be Noah's debut, and that got canceled. And so I know you all are looking forward to seeing him. If you saw any pictures of him two or three weeks ago, you won't recognize him because that breast, that, that, that breast milk is working. <laughs> Every part of him is getting bigger. His head's getting bigger, legs are getting bigger, arms are getting bigger. He's very healthy, and we want to keep him that way. But Noah hopefully will debut next week. Amen? Amen. I came here today prepared for nobody to look up the pastor after church because I thought we were going to have Noah's debut and somebody, I'm told, got a new chariot. So I, I knew that everybody was going to be focusing on Noah and the chariot. I didn't expect for, as a pastor for somebody to be coming up to me, hey, pastor, let me talk to you after church. Amen. Hallelujah. So I guess the chariot will get all the attention today. Amen. Because Noah's not here. It'll be his turn Next week, one quick point of uh, uh, announcement, I believe that the scholarship uh, application time ended on this past Friday. I'm told that we have at least 12 or 13 scholarship applications, and so we thank God that some folks are going to allow us to check into their lives and hopefully make a difference in their lives. And so if there are any of you that are involved in this ministry that are interested in helping with the scholarship interviews, uh, please let Sister Laquisha know uh, so that we can put you on the list and allow you to participate in this particular way that we bless people on behalf of God. Amen? Amen. This way that we show love. See, you get, you, just like with the nursing home, those who became involved in the nursing home, they heard about it, and we went through the training, but now they know about it. Now they know exactly the spirit with which we do it. They know exactly why we do it the way we do it. Amen? Amen? And so feel free to consider the possibility of helping with the scholarship so you can see those applications, so you can see those people who God puts in front of us, and so you can see us manifest God's love, so you can get a little bit better sense of what we do, because it's not just giving away money. We're actually making a difference. We're showing folks, just like at the nursing home, but younger people usually, that they are seen, that they matter. Amen. There's some students that get scholarships from us, and they didn't get scholarships in other ways because their interviews don't play to the other purposes, because their grades are not as good as we all want them to be, but they still matter to God. Amen. 
There's some people that have gone home and just celebrated with their family in tears because I got a scholarship, mom. I wrote what I wrote. I filled out the form. I went and talked to the people and they validated me. At school, they teased me or they marginalized me, but they valid. I matter. I did it. I succeeded. Hallelujah. We have stories like that. And so we do what we do because God said to do it. We're not checking any boxes. And we're grateful to continue doing that work. And so we have, I know, at least 12 or 13. There may be more after we check the mail on Monday, after uh, Sister Laquisha checks the mail on Monday. And so we just thank God for allowing us to do this on his, his behalf. Amen. 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 So I hope some of you all uh, consider uh, joining in and helping us out. Are you ready for the word? Amen. Are you ready for the word? Amen. Are you ready for the word? Amen. Amen. It's good to see you up here, Brother Melvin. Hallelujah. Amen. We've got a nice balanced crowd. All I need is one more person over there. Amen. It would be totally balanced. But um, did you know that no one accomplishes anything that really matters or is important by themselves? Did you know that? I, cer I certainly know that. I couldn't uh, work this ministry by myself. There are those who labor right by your side. You can feel their elbows next to your elbows. There are those that, that, that are working right next to you in the work. Then there are others that just give you advice. They give you knowledge. They give you wisdom. And yet there are also others who give you financial support in your endeavors or other resources that they, that they offer to you in your endeavors. But also, did you know that not every person, not every company, not every organization with all the resources and things that they can offer you is actually good for you? Amen. Not every person, not every company, not every organization is fit for you. Not every organization is designed or meant for your purposes. It doesn't matter what they have to offer, not everybody is equally yoked with you. Amen. Not everybody was designed to help you with your purpose. Amen? Amen? And I'm talking to a group of Christians, and so I'm going to tell you, even if they say they believe in God, that doesn't mean that everybody, every person, every organization, every company is meant to be helping you. Amen? Amen. Even if they claim to believe in God. The devil believes in God, and he'll still leave you, lead you astray, amen? So not all help, brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you this morning, is good. Let me hear you say that. Not all help, not all help, is, good. help is good. Not all help, not all help is, meant for you. is meant for you. Not all help, not all help comes, from God. comes from God. There's a whole lot of help that can happen. There's a whole lot of folks that can boost your uh, retirement. They can boost your career, but that doesn't mean they're, they're really in it for the right reasons. Amen? It doesn't mean that they understand who you are and whose you are. Are you hearing me? Because we can get help that can hurt us. We can get help that can lead us astray. And so this morning, uh, I want to use a biblical example just to illustrate this point so that hopefully you can recognize the wrong kind of help uh, before it's too late, so that you can recognize it before you do go astray because all sorts of folks have all kinds of things uh, and that they want to help with. And particularly, pastors can benefit from this because there are many people that believe that they can help you uh, cause your ministry to blow up. There's all sorts of folks that have all sorts of manipulations and things that they can have you do to just gain more people. There's people that can help you get, make your brand better, give you a higher internet profile. There's people that can help you do all those things. They can help you fill up the building, but they'll have you doing things that you should not do, saying things that you should not say or not saying things that you should say. They'll have you caring more about the stuff and the numbers than the actual people and their salvation and their growth and their development, amen, and God, their relationship with God. They'll have you focusing on the wrong things if they think you care enough about those wrong things. 
If all you wanted is more people so you can pay the bills, they will help you find more people so you can pay the bills. But you, those people aren't right for you if you really want to get down for God. Those people don't have the right mechanisms for you if you really care about doing the right thing more than just doing it for more people. Or giving a message to more people, amen? Or just having a, a bigger building, amen? The point is, there's lots of help, but it's not all meant for you. But how do you discern? How do you know what help is for you and what help is not for you? Because, folks, if you don't take their help, they'll judge you. Did you know that? Amen? amen? amen. They'll say, you could have done this, you could have been this, you could have been that. They have all these resources, but not all resources are meant for a serious child of God. Are you hearing me? It's a little bit quiet in here, amen? It's been quiet all morning. I don't know what that's about, but God is still good, amen? amen. He is still, still good. So I just want us to, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time. I pray that it works out that way, <laughs> amen, so we can go enjoy that chariot. Not just look at it. Maybe we'll have time to everybody get a ride in the chariot. If I finish early, if I finish early, saints, we might all get a ride in the chariot. How about that? I heard it glides. I heard that it doesn't even touch the ground. I heard that it had, you know, people, you, you go to the car wash and you get an air freshener. Oh, not this one. Comes built in. Amen. And I might have an ache or a pain here and there. And I heard that we don't even need a masseuse or a masseur. I heard it massages. Now, how? But, but what if you fall asleep? All of that massaging and all fragrance, guess what? It drives itself. Hallelujah. It drives itself. So if you happen to fall asleep, it's all right. <laughs> amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So pastor, hurry on up. Hurry on up so we can swing low, sweet chariot. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we can check that chariot out. Let's have a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please move me out of the way. Uh, and touch your people through your word. Tell them what it is you want them to hear, Lord God. I pray that it will be a blessing in their lives and this planet as good seed and good soil. Help me, Lord God, this earthen vessel, imperfect man. Help me to deliver your word to your people, Lord God. Have them hear you and not me. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, now, we will have as our text this morning the book of Ezra, the book of Ezra, and uh, our primary text, and we won't go there first, we'll actually go there last, as sometimes happens to be the case, but our primary text you'll find in the book of Ezra, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. The book of Ezra, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, but we will find as a benefit to us the supporting text, which we will, also, which we will find in the book of Ezra also, but in chapters 1 and 3. Again, Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, with the supporting text found in Ezra chapters 1 and 3. And I'll take as a title for this message, and you already got a clue so far, it's not all help is good help. It's okay to say no. Not all help, I say to the people in the pews, I say to those who find themselves in the pulpit, not all help is good help. It's okay to say no. So if we can go to the book of Ezra, if you can find it, hopefully you found it, say amen if you have it. Amen. amen. Not all help is good help. Not all help is godly help. Not all help is meant for you. Not all help is fit for you. Amen. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. If you want to copy the world, if you want to be like the world, if you want to keep up with the world, but put God's name on it, there's lots of folks that can help you do that. But there's a lot fewer people that can help you do things God's way for God and for his glory to impact the world. So I'm talking to Christians this morning, and I want you to be able to recognize the fact that not all help is meant for you, and hopefully as a result of this message, you'll be able to discern it moving forward. Amen? Amen. So let's look at the book of Ezra again, 
Uh, and I'm going to start at chapter 1. As I told you, our principal text is in chapter 4. Well, let's just begin at chapter 1. Uh, we've learned a lot about the children of Israel and the fact that they went into Babylon and why they went into Babylon. And we uh, learned about Jeremiah a few weeks ago. And we know that they were in Babylon somewhere around 70 years. But this text allows us to see how they came out of Babylon. Amen? Amen. The post-exilic uh, 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 era when they were coming out of exile. And I'll begin reading at verse 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. Let me read that again. Now in the first year of King Cyrus, excuse me, Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. All this saying that what you're about to hear that happened in the first year of King Cyrus's reign when the Medo-Persians conquered the world and took it away, wrested it away from Babylon, who conquered the world and wrested it away from the Assyrians. So now we have the third great empire of Daniel's visions, the Medo-Persians, and its great leader, Cyrus the Great, is now the king. But it's saying here, so that Jeremiah's words from God might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he might make a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom. If you look it up as a huge kingdom, it was even bigger than the Babylonian kingdom, which was even bigger than the Assyrians. And he also put it in writing, saying this, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia. Listen to this. The Lord God, this is the king of Persia now. The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He knew this just like Nebuchadnezzar knew, knew it. He's given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem which is in Judah. Verse 3, who is there among you of all of his people? His God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, which is in Jerusalem. I don't know how much that moves you, but it reminds me that God is in control. And it's important that we all recognize that God is in control. It applies to our lives outside of church and it applies to ministry. Why does it matter? Because if you don't know that God is in control, you might become discouraged. You might become worried. You might start doing things ahead of God because you don't realize he's in control. You might just take help from somebody that you shouldn't. You might just buy into a program that's not consistent with what God's calling is on your life. You might grab a hold of something because you didn't realize that God is in control. Things weren't happening as fast as you thought. You hadn't have as many people as you thought. People didn't seem to be responding as quickly as you thought to what God has given you to say. You might forget that God is in control. And somebody will come along and say, I can help you. I can make it happen. I can cause you to blow up. And that'll be your demise. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to Ezra chapter 3. I told you our supporting text will be in chapters 1 and chapter 3. We've already learned here through the words of King Cyrus himself the leader of the entire known world, biblical world at least, at the time, that he is saying that God is in control, that the God of heaven, the God that we worship, was telling King Cyrus what he should do. They didn't have to break out of there and say, you better let us go home. He offered them to go home. Why? With what purpose? They didn't have to say like they did in Egypt, we want to go and worship our God in the desert. He said, I'm telling you to go. Who wants to go? Because your God has told me, the God has told me, 
the God gave me all, I'm talking about King Cyrus. So sure enough, we should be able to say that we know that what we have comes from God. This man that controlled the whole biblical known world said that God has given me all of this. And so I'm telling you to go worship him, amen? Go make a place and worship him. So let's go to chapter three. And we'll just look at a few verses uh, that will cover a couple key things that I want you to know. I want you to notice a couple things from this. Let's go ahead and read it. And when the seventh month came, and the children of Israel were in the cities, we're talking about now they're back in Judah, where the tribe of Ju tribes of Judah and Benjamin came from. So now they're in their cities. The people gathered themselves together. In their cities, they do their own thing. But now they're gathering themselves together as one man, one people, one mind, one heart, and even one voice to Jerusalem. They're laying aside their individual lives. They're laying aside their individual pursuits and endeavors, and they're coming to Jerusalem as one person, one mind, one heart, one purpose. Then stood up Jeshua, that's actually pronounced Yeshua, which is the exact name that Jesus had. Amen. His name wasn't Jesus. That's a Latinized, that's a Romanized name. Amen. His name was Yeshua, the son of Josedek and his brethren, the priests. Amen. Now this Yeshua was the high priest. He was the first high priest of the post-exilic people that went back, went back to establish their position in Jerusalem and their opportunity to worship God. And Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. And Zerubbabel was the civic leader, amen? He was, he was the leader of the government while Yeshua was the leader of the spiritual goings on, amen? Yeah. And his brethren. And what is the first thing they did? They builded the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon as it is written, not just any way they wanted to, but as it was written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis. They found the place that the altar had been on and they placed the new altar exactly where it used to be. Why? For fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, the other peoples that were not them. They were concerned that they would run up against a, a, a danger from outsiders, so they wanted God's blessing. So the first thing they focused on was worshiping God through sacrifice. And so they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord. Even burnt offerings, morning and evening, they established that cadence, they established that, that ritual, if you will, that consistency, morning and evening, which is what was supposed to happen on the altar of God. They kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. I want you to notice just a couple of things here. First of all, I want you to notice from Cyrus that God is in control. It'll help you make better decisions. It'll help you avoid the bad ones, amen, or many of them. So I want you to notice here just, number one, how serious they are about worshiping God. You don't see anything else here but focus on worshiping God. Yeah, they had a little concern about folks around them, but they knew from which cometh their help. So they have an opportunity now to worship God. The other thing I want you to notice is how unified they are. They set aside their own. It's not a wrong thing to have your individual pursuits and interests and things that you want to do. But they came together. Notice the unity. They were unified in that purpose of building the altar and giving God what he said he wanted to have the way he wanted to have it, even the times that he wanted to have it. I'm reminded of the fact that when God's people are serious about serving God and are unified in that endeavor, great things can happen. When God's people are serious about serving God and are unified, I'm not talking about numbers, I'm talking about quality. Yeah. Unified in that endeavor. Yeah. 
Great things always happen. You can be small and mighty if people of God are serious about God and are unified in that purpose. And in this particular case, their first priority was establishing the sacrifices to God. But there still was no temple for God to be present in yet. Amen? Amen. So that takes us to the same chapter, but let's go over to verse 10. We have Cyrus that sent them back to establish themselves in Jerusalem, in Judah in general, but Jerusalem in particular, to establish the worship of God there. And we now have the sacrificial system in place. But now we need the home of God. We need the house of God. We need the sanctuary of God. We need the temple of God. And so let's read verses 10 and 11. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with what? Trumpets. Make a joyful noise. And the Levites, the son of Asaph, with symbols make a joyful noise to praise the Lord after the ordinances of David, king of Israel. And what did they do? They sang together by course. What this means is call and response. Can you just imagine the worship? Can you just imagine the praise songs that they had? They sang together by course, meaning it was call and response. Call and response, praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. Why? Because he is good. Why? Because his mercy endureth forever towards Israel. Hallelujah. And all the people did what? They shouted a great shout when they praised the Lord. They didn't just do it quietly. I guess it's all right to praise God quietly, but it won't be quiet in heaven and it wasn't quiet here. They didn't take for granted that they could worship God in his place, in their home. They couldn't take it for granted. We do. Which is often why we don't exercise that right, that opportunity. It says here, because the foundation, why were they worshiping? Why were they shouting? Why were they happy? Why were they joyous? Why were they singing? Why? Because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Hallelujah. I didn't say they finished it. I didn't say it was in its wonderful glory and splendor. I said they poured a foundation. And they were shouting. I said, they just poured a foundation and they were praising. I said, they just poured a foundation. Anybody ever been excited about a foundation? Anybody ever been excited about just the beginnings, uh, the roots, the basis of something? Hallelujah. I've been excited about a foundation. I hear Brother Jason out there. He was been, he'd been excited. Anybody that's been privileged enough to have a house built from scratch knows what it's like to have a foundation and, and to be silly and giddy about just the foundation. I've been excited just about dirt. <laughs> Woo, that's my dirt. That's my foundation. You know what? You get excited. You say, this is what, where this will go, and that's where, that's where that room will be, and this is where the kitchen's going to be, and this is where the, oh, I get to have me a double oven for the first time. This is where the dishwasher's going to be. You get excited about the basic beginnings. Hallelujah. Even before you see all of the manifestation. Hallelujah. And so they were excited because they had expectation. They were excited about the beginnings because they couldn't take that for granted. They'd been in exile. And they had more encouragement along the way. Haggai, the prophet, in chapter 2, we see his words where God promised them that the latter house will be greater than the former house. Now, those aren't just words. They were actually responsive to the fact that it's not always good to be old and experienced because it was the old experienced ones that knew the old house that saw this foundation and said, I don't know if it's up to par. 
So they started, while the, some, most were shouting, you had some sort of wondering, complaining, even crying, this won't be worthy of our God. But God made it clear to them that the latter house will be greater than the former house. And he went on and he told Zerubbabel through prophet Zechariah that you laid the foundation to Zerubbabel. I know that you're worried about some things, but for you, mountains will be made flat. I will shake up the whole earth. You laid the foundation. And don't you worry, you will finish this project. So it's not just going to happen, it's going to happen in your lifetime. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So with all of that, the expectation, the joy of being in this place and pouring the foundation and God ensuring you that you will finish the job. And its splendor will be beyond what it seems like now. It's going to be better than what it looks like it's going to be. God went on to say, I believe it was in Haggai, forgive me if it's, if it's in Zechariah, but he said, I own all the gold, I own all the silver, I have, it, oh, it's going to have splendor, just chill. <laughs> it's going to be all that. So with all of that, God on your side, the king telling you to go do it, I mean, what more could you ask for? He's promised you it's going to have great splendor. He's promised the leader Zerubbabel that it's going to be done in his lifetime. What more could you ask for? I want to make the point that they now had all that they needed. They were winning. And so God said many of the things that he said because he could not leave those elder statesmen and women. I think they probably were mostly men. He could not leave them in that place of wondering and worrying whether this was going to live up to the prior splendor of the prior house. Why? Because when you have those kinds of doubts, when you don't recognize that this foundation means you're winning, when you don't know that you're winning, you make bad decisions. When you don't know that you're winning, you start comparing. Oh, they compared to the prior thing that they saw. The other ones didn't, hadn't seen it. They weren't around. So they were just happy for the foundation. Oh, but you're comparing to what you used to have. You start chasing things and doing what you shouldn't do because you're comparing. Sometimes we compare to what somebody else has. Oh, God gave them. Well, you don't know that God gave it to them. You just know it looks good on the outside. You don't even know if it's good. You just know it looks good. And so here's the trick. Satan knows when you want that versus you just want the dream and the, th and, the pr and the mission and the vision that God gave you to come to fruition. He knows the difference when you want what somebody else has because it looks better. He knows the difference. God will always bless you to manifest the thing that he told you and he birthed inside of you, but somebody else will come along and give you what somebody else had or what you used to have. Amen? Amen. So you'll start comparing. If you don't realize you're winning, you'll ensure you're losing mainly by comparison. Or you might just get in a hurry. God has, God has promised you. I promise you he's, oh, he's going to be a man of his, uh, a God of his word. He's going to do what he told you. But you might want him to do what somebody else has. Or you might want him to do it before he's ready to do it on your timetable. So what happens when you don't realize you're winning? You make comparisons and you get in a hurry. You end up soliciting or accepting help. That's not good for you. That's not meant for you. Amen? Amen. So now we go to Ezra chapter 4. All of that was background. Pastor, you're just now getting to the main text. But you know a few things now. You know context. You know the state of mind. You know what God has promised. You know where, where, where the word, the edict came from, the decree came from. You now know that they are absolutely winning. You now know they have everything they need. A promise from God and an opportunity. I said they had everything they need. A promise from God and an opportunity. I said they have everything they need. I don't care what the foundation looks like. I don't care if it's not the same size as the former one. I don't care if it's smaller than somebody else's. Amen. They had a promise from God, a calling of God, and an opportunity. How much more do you need? 
If you're looking for more than that, that's where trouble is. You want to know where trouble is? When you're looking for more than that. When you must have more than that. When you get vulnerable. When you start responding to what people say or the looks that they give. Or sometimes the way that it feels. That's where the trouble is. Sometimes you're winning. You don't know that you have peace in the little that you have. And you don't know the headaches of the ones who have the stuff that you see. So now we go to Ezra to our principal text. Lord have mercy. Thank you for getting me thus far. Chapter 4. And we're first going to look at the first three verses. I told you that the text goes through verse 4. But we'll start up with the first three. And so I'll, I'll go ahead and read it. Now when the adversaries of Judah... And Benjamin, these are the two tribes that were in the southern kingdom, heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel. Now, I want to keep going, but I'm going to distract you a little bit by asking you a favor. I'm going to ask you that when we read this first part, so now when the, and then the next word is what? adversary I'm going to ask you to you can't unsee what you've just seen (laughs) you can't unread what you just read but I'm going to ask you because the writer took license the writer already knew the outcome the writer was writing to people that it was okay to say that they were adversaries but they were not yet overtly adversarial and so we would be better for our purposes to just say Samaritans. Now when the Samaritans of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, let us build with you. For we seek your God. We seek your God as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assur, which brought us up hither. Now, a Bible scholar or somebody that studied the Bible will know that it is this second verse that lets you know that they were Samaritans. It lets you know that at a minimum they were Assyrians because when the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, they actually took away most of the people over to Nineveh and other cities in the kingdom of Assyria. And they replaced them with their people. And those men got with those women and made Samaritans. Do you see the origin of Samaritans? Do you see how the Jews might not like Samaritans just on that basis? And so they were not adversaries yet. And so as they saw, they heard, first of all, all of the hubbub, all of the shouting, all of the trumpets, all of the cheering, all of the praising. So everybody knew that something was going on. And they said, hey, we hear that you're building a a house for the Lord God. And guess what? Can we help you build? Let us build with you. For we seek God as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days that the king brought us on up over here. Amen? And then we get to verse 3. But Zerubbabel and Yeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel, what did they say? They said, you have nothing to do with us to build and house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord. Now, we ourselves together, this is what we've been noticing all along. We ourselves together committed ourselves, left our cities to build an altar to God. We ourselves together established all of the, all of the festivals, etc., of God around that altar and sacrifice. We ourselves together are worshiping our God because we've laid a foundation and we can see the future. God will keep his word. We ourselves together 
will build unto the Lord God of Israel. Notice these are serious people at this point. Oh, they will eventually be found to be flawed as we all are. But we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Amen, amen, amen. The Samaritans wanted to help. Isn't that a good thing? The Samaritans wanted to help. They wanted to build a temple to Yahweh at Jerusalem. Is that not a good thing? But the Jewish leader said what? No. Now, what did I tell you the title of this message is? Not all help is good help, colon, it's okay to say no. Amen. Hallelujah. The Jewish people said, together, we will complete this project unto our God ourselves. So why not take the assistance? Why not take the help that's offered to you? Why not take the programs? Why not take the things, the machine? By the way, there's a machine that makes stars in the entertainment industry. There's a machine that makes stars of people who are former athletes. They're that only a few get the goods and everybody else is working stiffs. There's a machine. They come up with a new pop star every year or two to replace the other one that finishes their little contract that they didn't get much out of. There's a machine, and there's also a machine that makes stars in the church. There's a machine that creates star power in buildings. Amen? Do you understand there is, there's plenty of help? But not all help is good. There's plenty of help, but it's okay to say what? No. But wouldn't they finish quicker? If they accepted the help, maybe. They certainly could have avoided offending the Samaritans if they just accepted the help. But they said no. Now, the text doesn't tell us explicitly why they said no. They just said, we got this. This is not about you. This is not particularly for you. This is our God, and we are finally here to establish our worship of him. Amen? Amen? Now, we don't know exactly why they said no. Some would say it's on a racist or a racial basis because they were Samaritans. Others would say it was just purely, this is an exclusive thing. It ain't about you being Samaritans. It's about you being anybody but us. It's possible. That those were the reasons. But here's what we know. We know that God was not just the God of the Jews. We learned that through Jonah, did we not? Amen. We learned that lesson. Did we not learn it? Amen. Did we not learn it? Amen. Had we not learned that, then I'd have to preach all that for you to understand this point. That if they were doing it on the basis of exclusivity, that ain't entirely true. So those who excuse it away on that basis are looking at the whole council. Amen? But if we play, pay close attention, I'm going to land this plane, hopefully with good time so we can swing over there and see that chariot. If we pay attention, slow down and pay attention, we might see why at least, while we don't know explicitly why they turned it down, I'm going to tell you some reasons why they were right to turn it down. Are you willing to go through that exercise with me? Amen. I pray that it won't take very long. The Samaritans provided, if we go back to verse 2 of chapter 4, the Samaritans provided some really logical reasons, some logical basis for offering their help. They wanted to help or they thought that they should help in the building of the temple. If we go to chapter 4, verse 2, we see them saying, let us build with you. Why? Why? Because we seek your God as you do. Amen? Let me help you. I believe in God. Let me help you. I'm also a Christian. Not all Christians are the same. Amen. Not all Christians are the same. Amen. When they said, we seek your God as you do, that word seek does not mean we seek him to get, become more near to him. It does not mean we seek him to worship and to serve him. It simply means we resort to him. We make inquiries of him. 
They saw Yahweh as a convenient source among others when they deemed appropriate and necessary. Not the same way they were focusing on God as the God, as the only God, as their only God. Oh, they would lose it later. But right now, they're being focused on godly things. They're being serious about godly things. But the help that was being offered was among those who their argument is that we seek God just as you do. But I don't think you seek God the way I do. They went on to say in their qualifications that they sacrifice unto God. Where, where is it at? In verse 2 it says, we seek God as you do, and we do sacrifice unto him since the days that we were brought over here from Assyria. The Samaritans sacrificed to God. They did. But they also sacrificed to idol gods. They also sacrificed to things they can't speak, hear, or see. They didn't just sacrifice to Yahweh, the only true and living God. And so he wasn't the God. He was a God to them. So their qualifications that they're putting forth make it look like they're using nice words. They're speaking the religious language, but they're not actually saying the things that would make them equally yoked to the moment for the people, for this task, for this purpose, for this reason. Not saying that unsaved folks that don't really love God can't help you along the way, but there's some things that they shouldn't be involved in. Amen. So they believed in God, check. They said lots of religious words, check. They even practiced religion. Check. They even let that religion include Yahweh. Check. But they didn't honor God as God. They resorted to God. And that's not the same as worshiping God. They resorted to God. That's not the same as serving God. Some people that ask us to be more materialistic as our privilege cause us to resort to God rather than worship and serve God. They call themselves helping. They may even mean well, but they don't lead you to the right place. Are you hearing me? Amen. Not all help is good help. Amen. Not all help is godly help. Not all help is meant for you. Not all help is good for you. Not all help is consistent with who you're supposed to be. Your job is to notice and discern, and it's okay to say no. Finally, I'll quickly look at verse 4 as I land this plane. It says, then the people of the land, now the people of the land is used two different ways. In one sense, it's used to talk about the children of Israel. God used that term in reference to them. In this case, the people of the land are talking about the people who were already there that were not Jewish when, when the exiles came back. So then the people of the land what did they do? They weakened the hands of the people of Judah. That is a biblical King James way of saying they got in the way. They sabotaged the efforts. They weren't adversaries overtly before, but guess what? They are now. And they troubled them in building. So whatever happened to the, I'm here for you. Whatever happened to the, I want to get all the way up in that with you. Whatever happened to the, we are also serve they never said they serve God they said we sacrificed him they said we resort to him we ask him for things when other things don't work so they were never really down with God but they sounded like they were you might think that they are you might yoke up with them and try to get something done but what you're going to find out soon enough is that you're unequally yoked Amen. but you know what you can find out beforehand you know how say no you ever had anybody that wanted some money from you? You want to find out if they're really down with you? You want to find out if the first part of that conversation when they acted like they cared about you, asking you how you doing? <laughs> Say no. <laughs> Say no. <laughs> if you're a physician and you have somebody looking for a certain kind of drug 
and they say nicely the first time why they think they need that drug and, and, and try saying no, you'll find out what they're really about. So the children of Israel said, no, we got this. God has already told us he's going to help us to do this. We don't know all the reasons why they said no. I'm telling you some reasons why they should say no, because these folks were really not down with God. They were, really didn't see God as God. He was an expediency. He was somebody that they could go to among other gods. He was not the God. He was not Yahweh, their only God. They were not saying we, we are not Jewish, but we want to be proselytes, uh, Jews, uh, and serve God. No, 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 no. We serve him just like you do. No, you don't. No, you don't. Hallelujah. So why does this matter? There's plenty of help out there. People will want to help you grow your church, grow your ministry, blow up your career, help you with your taxes, tell you how to do your business. But do they know how serious you are about God? Do they know how far you are willing to go and no farther because God is your rock? Do they know that lines that get blurred in all of the rest of the world, maybe even in some ministries, you are serious about God over here? They can't help you. Or maybe they think they can, but once they find out that you're not willing to go along with the shenanigans that work for everybody else, that, they accept, that, that everybody else accepts from them, they'll quickly let you know, you know, actually maybe this isn't a fit. You ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. One surefire way to find out whether somebody's really down with you or down with God, down with your purpose truly respects you. Those who are really down with God will still be down with God when you say no. Those who really have your interest at heart and really love you and respect you, you'll know it after you say no. Lord, have mercy. We could just, I could have just said that. <laughs> and then we could get over to the chariot. So here's the thing. Had they accepted the help, this is what they'd be entangled with. Somebody that really wasn't down with God for the right reasons. Somebody that worships idols in addition to God. This is what they, you know this is the, where the problem started in the first place. Uh -huh. And somebody that is, so all you had to say was no. And then they, go get, they wrote letters to the king, lied on them. They delayed the project by two years. Would they have been better off accepting the help? No, I'm telling you, they're better off accepting the two years delay. Would they have been better off accepting the tainted help? Absolutely not. Would they have been better off being hooked up with somebody that claimed to be down with them and God, and as soon as you say no, they throw a wrench in everything? You care about God, why are you going to block the building of his temple? You couldn't care about God very much. If you care about me, you clearly don't respect me. I told you no. I told you I got this. This was really about you, not about me. You ever seen anything like that? Now, to be honest, I'm telling you about the decision that they made when they were at their best. Because the truth is, they eventually did blow it. They eventually, as they were moving towards building, it, it got built. And it got built in the, it, within the time frame that God said. Zerubbabel finished the job, but they got focused on their own lives. They got focused on their own thing. They got focused on their own houses. And they really started to drag their feet eventually. But they still would have been worse off had they got hooked up with these jokers. Because they would have gone into idolatry sooner. They eventually went into idolatry as well. Why? Because they married the women they weren't supposed to marry. And if you look at the book of Nehemiah, at the end of that book, what is Nehemiah doing? All the wall is built. All oh, that's great, right? But Nehemiah had to cancel the marriages. He had to had them divorce all of their uh, uh, um, foreign wives and send them packing. Why? because it polluted God's people in his worship environment. He had to cancel all of those marriages at the end of the book of Nehemiah. 
So I hope that we're learning this morning that there are plenty of folks that can help you. But with something as important as ministry or anything else that you feel is vital to your life, that you believe that God has called you to do or to be, people will have nice words. They'll even seem to have good intentions. They'll even sometimes make themselves sound godly. But you need to test every spirit. And I want you to make sure that you understand that they need to know before you get hooked up with them, entangled with them, accept their help. They need to know how important God is to you. And you need to know if they claim to be Christian, if they claim to believe God, you need to know how they see God. Because they might see God as just somebody that everybody, you know, attaches themselves to verbally. They might see God as somebody that you call on to get you stuff. That's not what you're talking about. They need to know the difference. Amen? And you need to know the difference. How do they see God? Is he truly God? Because that's what you're talking about. If they're going to really help you do what God told you to do, called you to do, blessed you to do, then they need to know that this is the real thing. This is not just about numbers. This is not just about blowing up on the internet. This is not just about looking good. This is not just ha about having a better answer when people ask you. This is about doing the real thing the right way no matter what. Anybody that helps you needs to know that. Amen. Amen. Good enough. Being able to be the, you know, the, the CEO is not good enough if I got to do it the wrong way. So think about what things you might have to divorce if you accept the help. What regrets might you have later? And also remember that not everything can be solved later. You might get yourself caught up in something you can't get yourself out of. You might get intertwined and connected with something that you cannot easily extricate yourself from. So in the end, I go back to the title what God wants you to know today, and I don't know who needs this. I don't know who's looking for this. I don't know who woke up this morning struggling with something, and this is exactly what they were looking for. Oh, my goodness. Not only can I say no, but I ought to say no. Not only can I say no and I ought to say no, I think now I have what I need to say no because now I know I actually have what I need. Now I know I actually have who I need. Now I know God's on my side. Now I'm confident that he's going to do what he said he would do and I don't need to help him do it. I don't need others to help me to help him do it. I don't have to give in to the compromises. I don't have to hurry up and make him move faster or get out ahead of him. Now I know somebody woke up this morning. Somebody tuned in this morning. And they had a challenge. They had a dilemma. They don't have a dilemma anymore. They know that it's not only okay to say no, it's right to say no. And now somebody can't wait to say no. If that person's in your contacts, hit that button now. Say, so you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. I don't think we're equally yoked on this. I'm not sure. Or I see you're going to help me. Like, can I just tell you who I really am? Can I just tell you what I really live by? Can I just tell you who I really serve? Can I just tell you how far I'm willing to go? Can I just tell you what I'm not going to do? Can I just tell you? It's not about me. Can I just tell you who was really about God and his people and his purpose? So I thank God for helping me help you uh, to understand that not all help is good. Not all help comes from God. Not all help is fit for you, is right for you. Not all help is appropriate and ordained for you. And I thank God for showing us what to look for. We're better prepared. We're better equipped. And somebody is better able this morning to say no because it's okay. And finally, I just ask you, do you remember that God will do? I'm going to say this one slowly because it gets hard sometimes. God will keep his word. God will do every single thing that he said he would do in your life.
it might take, just like with Israel, a little bit longer. The delays that they cause is one thing, but the delay that happened because they said no to these knuckleheads that started to subvert and undermine the, the work of the, of the building of God's temple, that's a whole nother thing. You want that delay. You want that delay. Amen? So remember, God's going to do everything he said he would do, and it might take a little longer. Did you know that? You could be doing the right thing, and it could take longer because you did the right thing. Because your enemy doesn't want you to do the right thing. Your enemy wants to hook up with you, but not for the right reasons and the right ways. You're better off taking the longer route if that's the route that God takes you on. I love the Lord. I thank him for his word. I praise him for the the lives that he's touched with this word who are now free to say no, to help that doesn't fit them, that doesn't belong to them, that's not ordained for them, that doesn't have the purposes that God gave them. They can now know that it's okay to say no and that God has got this. He has controlled the leaders of all of the dominating kingdoms throughout all of the ages. And he controls our president. He controls the other leaders. He controls the Iranian leaders. He controls it all because ultimately they have to make the decisions to make God's word true. He ha- they have to make the decisions that cause prophecy to be fulfilled. So don't argue and push and pull. You can protest all you want. But guess what? Your protests are part of the plan. You just don't know it. You thought you decided to protest because your heart was so big for the Palestinians. It's okay to have a big heart. Just know God is still in control. Yes, there are people dying. Yes, many of them are innocent. But it is not the first time innocent people die. So cry for them. Pray for them. Love them. But do know this is all working to a place. Israel's going to need some peace. And somebody's going to come provide it. And you know that's what we're working ourselves up to. Lord, have mercy. I thank God for his word. I thank you for prophecy being fulfilled. I thank you for the energy to deliver this word and people willing to sit here all this time and absorb it and hopefully be able to disseminate it. I thank you. I thank God. And as always, to God be the glory. Amen. (laughs) Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for your word, Lord God. Hallelujah. Somebody needed this word this morning, Lord God, and I thank you. Hallelujah for showing up. Hallelujah for them. Hallelujah. You may not come when we want you, but you are always right on time. Hallelujah. Your mercies endure it forever. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord.